Mic check, mic check. Hi guys, I'm gonna do one more mic check and probably one more for you after this. Great, thank you. Yeah. Put that anywhere. And side right here. Yeah, that'll work. Outstanding, yeah. Hello guys. I'd like to thank the Academy for giving me this award. I'd like to thank my parents and my producer and Mosullah, I'd like to thank Satan. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, check one. Everybody got a good mic check? I'm waiting on uh, the over there. Okay. I'd like to thank Satan. <laughs> yeah, I know. Just... Dude, that's the, that, that, I, I'd love to have Stop you on Soundcheck. In, yeah, I want to have, have you on Soundcheck. <laughs> Just to see the look. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. I think obviously going to change at the last minute because this is Congress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Okay, are you putting Yep, by the other. Okay, perfect. Are we allowing her to speak? We have to. At She's the very end? She's off. She's Oh, okay. So he's, he has it here. Thank you so much, bro. Yep. Get her here. We're working on it. We still gotta wait for so, some of the members. So after Chewy? After Chewy is Ilhan. Yeah, okay. Where's Robin? And then, dude, I think you can do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's going to get to Okay, so we should gather up with your phone. I need to know. Yeah, I think if, I think everybody else is here. Yeah. Oh yeah, I uh I just like a keyboard. Oh yeah, I can record it. Hey, can I respond? How are you? Hi, how are you doing? Yes, there's not a lot of space up there. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, Kevin? Kevin? Can you give me my stack back? <laughs> or maybe just to get enough. I'll give you those separately. Yeah. Okay, I'll put them in the folder. Okay, so, um, who, if you're in this order, we have it up here. You'll introduce the next person. Okay. So, I'm going to be starting it. No, I said, I just you're such a warm guy. Yeah, yeah, and then you'll be introduced. This is the warmest reception I've ever got on this side of the island. <laughs> This because it's floor house. Which are <laughs> and then <laughs> and then we know you are busy, so <laughs> he's gonna go home. Are you good to see you? Um and so so you will I don't know if you saw the list here. So he'll introduce you and then you'll introduce him. If he's here by now. Can't buy you? Okay. Yeah. Si no, if he's not, just go to the next person. To Jerry? Okay. Yeah, and if he's not. Okay. Keep going. Okay, yeah. Pramila is here. I'm not seeing Jerry. Okay. Yeah. So if you're on the <laughs> Hey, they did. They did. How are you? Good to see you. Never tried. <laughs> hey, Gabe. Hey, Senator. Good to see you, Ivana. Hey, hey, right here. Yeah, all right. I'm doing good. Okay. <laughs> Good? The shortest. Are we good? <laughs> when I'm five feet tall, no one, I mean. Okay, good afternoon. Allow me. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Congress Member uh, Nane Barragan and Chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, which is now a 42 member strong, the largest caucus we've ever had. Uh, the CHCs gather here today with our partners, um, which are leaders, uh, members of other caucuses here um, on the Hill. We're here for one reason. We are here to fight to protect immigration as it is. Or let, let me put it a little differently. We're, we're here to call on President Biden and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to reject the immigration and border proposals at the hands of Republicans in the ongoing negotiations around the supplemental aid package. Republicans continue to hold funding for America's allies hostage at the expense of migrants and to pass Trump-era border policies. Republicans are pitting vulnerable groups against each other to strong-arm policies that will exacerbate chaos at the southern border. We are urging the Biden administration to say no. Do not take the bait. We are calling on our colleagues to hold the line, to hold the line. Truthfully, the White House, and I've said this, should not have put 
border policy um, together with foreign aid and that the two should be separated out. Now, I think that this is going to set a dangerous precedent, uh, which is why we are standing here today. And this is exactly what Republicans want. Uh, they want to be able to get this now. And anytime we vote on something else on foreign aid or whatever it is, they're going to ask for more and more and more. The CHC is concerned about the reports, the most recent reports that we're hearing now of these Trump era immigration policies possibly becoming permanent laws in exchange for one time funding. And worse, these negotiations, negotiations are taking place without a single Latino senator at the table, without a single <coughs> CHC member at the table, and not even consultation or engagement with our Latino, Latino lawmakers. And that is completely unacceptable. As chair of the Hispanic Caucus, I urge the president to completely reject these ongoing conversations in which we are giving up. And we are saying that we're gonna put basically an end to asylum. We cannot allow that to happen. And two, we need to continue to push to have our CHC senators at the table and in the room. And we call on the White House to also engage with the Hispanic Caucus and meet with us and work towards a solution. A solution that we can all come together and support. And the CHC will continue to sound the alarm bell on all the immigration policies that are being brought up and these funding negotiations uh, that are going to be harmful. We know Republicans don't want to solve this problem. Some of what they're offering is only going to make things worse. And some of what they're offering doesn't even have anything to do with the southern border. And so we will hold the line. And with that, I'm going to have the honor of introducing the senator from New Jersey, who's been a champion for immigrants, a champion on this issue for a long time, and has been fighting in the Congress for a very long time to get comprehensive immigration reform. With that, Senator Menendez. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I'm thrilled to join my colleagues in the House and in the Senate, uh, and uh, not just the Hispanic Caucus, but the Asian Pacific Caucus, the Black Caucus, the Progressive Caucus. Uh, it is a wide concern uh, that we have. When I read reports last night about the abhorrent immigration policy changes the Biden administration is considering, I thought I entered a time machine back to the Trump era. I could not comprehend how a Democratic president who vehemently countered Trump's policies as a candidate is seriously putting forward the most Trumpian anti-immigrant proposal that President Trump himself could only have dreamed of accomplishing. These would be the most far-sweeping anti-immigrant and permanent changes to our law in a generation. It would be a complete betrayal. The administration's proposals read like a bucket list of Stephen Miller's wildest fantasies. Resurrecting a Title 42-like authority, which would shut out even the consideration for asylum dramatically expanding migrant detention without adjudicating their cases, eroding due process in mass, expanding expedited remo removals to the interior of the country, raising the specter of roving deportation squads threatening dreamers, immigrant families, essential workers, and millions of others who have called America home for years, if not decades. Adding serious insult to injury, as the chairwoman said, not a single member, not one, of the House or Senate Congressional Hispanic Caucus is at the table for these talks. Not a single member of the CHC was given a heads up that the administration would be proposing or considering these right-wing non-starters, despite outreach from many of us over the last several weeks requesting to meet in person with the White House Chief of Staff. That is a hard slap in the face 
to all the Latino and immigrant communities we represent. Imagine the administration trying to cut a deal on voting rights or civil rights without bringing any members of the Congressional Black Caucus to the table. That would never be tolerated, and we absolutely cannot tolerate this either. The president is terribly mistaken if he thinks he can find support for these types of proposals among members of the CHC, the CBC, KPAC, and the CPC, as well as all those who care deeply about the well-being and future of our immigrant communities. What the president is putting forward, if it is as reported, I think is dead on arrival. It's a complete non-starter. We must not allow ourselves to be pressured into accepting these poison pills in the name of supporting our allies abroad. Let me just say that. I have sat on the Foreign Relations Committee on Foreign Policy for 31 years. If the roles were reversed and Republicans were in the majority and we were doing such a thing, they would excoriate us for abandoning our allies and putting our national security at risk. And at the time of the call for freedom to be absent. We cannot trade away fundamental protections for immigrants as a price to pass a supplemental aid package. Just as Republicans are willing to delay aid in the name of harming immigrants, we must be willing to do so in order to protect them. Holding the line here may be politically perilous, no doubt, but the time is now for us to meet the moment and speak out with moral clarity. We cannot stand idly by while an extreme Republican Party hell-bent on scapegoating and hurting immigrants tries to achieve their way. We cannot remain silent if leaders within our own party are selling out communities and then arrogantly turn to them on election day of next year expecting them to vote for them. This is not a time to mince words. The Democratic Party must decide. Are we the party that welcomes immigrants and understands our long history as a nation of immigrants? Are we the party that will ultimately, however, fundamentally gut asylum and pave the way for Trumpian anti-immigrant policies that are being proposed? So here's my personal message. And by the way, this is not about not doing anything. The suggestion by some that we are for doing nothing at the border is absolutely wrong. In April of this year, I put out a plan that extensively went through the things that we can do to deal with the challenges of the border and to deal with the 20 million people displaced in the southern hemisphere who don't have a place to call home and are in other countries that we could work with. There's a lot we could do, but what is being suggested is not going to achieve the solution. I think it will exacerbate it and it will dramatically change our course and our history as a country. So my message for the president, please don't go down this road don't cave in to the extreme Republican immigration proposals, because if you do so, you cement your leg legacy as the asylum denier in chief. That's not something we want to see. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, and now uh, let me introduce my colleague, who has been a tremendous ally, you know, when we are in that caucus room alone with other members and making our case, uh, there is no one who has uh, been a stronger voice alongside me. Uh, than the senator from New Mexico, uh, Senator Ben Ray Lujan. Well, thank you all for, for coming today for this important conference. I want to thank Nanette Baragan, the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, for bringing us together again and for her steadfast ad advocacy in standing strong in our concerns with what's playing out before our eyes. The plan that Senator Menendez just showed us is a reminder of plans that were put forth that offer real solutions to challenges that a broken immigration system in America faces. I want to emphasize something that Senator Menendez said. There have been many that have been suggesting that folks in the Senate and the House don't want to do anything in this space. That is wrong. My mom and dad would just say, it's a lie. These plans have been put forth that will offer significant solutions, and Senator Menendez just laid out one. 
with the return of some of these policies that are being proposed, that are being talked about as we gather here today with the return of policies that were offered, authored by Stephen Miller and put forth by folks like Donald Trump, remain in Mexico. I want to illustrate something that many of us in the Congressional Hispanic Caucus saw with our very eyes. And what I'm sharing with you was in Matamoros. Norma Torres, Nanette Baragan have similar stories. Veronica Escobar has her stories from years ago when I was in the house and we all traveled together to bring attention to what was happening. When many of us traveled to Matamoros to see what was happening under these Title 42 so-called Remain in Mexico policies, some of the most vulnerable families were in encampments without water, without electricity, with latrines that were dug by hand in these very areas. Single moms that I had the honor to learn from and to visit with that would not sleep at night out of fear that their young children might be kidnapped or raped. Lawless areas that were created that not even the UN was invited to go into. That will all return. How could we as the United States of America advocate for the creation of anything like this? And that's just one of these policies. I certainly hope and pray that there are those at the White House that are listening. That we have asked for a meeting with the Chief of Staff, Mr. Zients. Please take it. Let's sit down and talk. And let's find real solutions that are going to be meaningful for all of the challenges that are before us in the United States of America while living up to our national security responsibilities one of our colleagues that has been speaking up on a daily basis, not just in his responsibility as the chairman of the subcommittee on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate that has jurisdiction over this space, but every chance he gets wherever he may be across California or here in Washington, D.C. And I want to introduce you and, and ask our next, our next speaker to come up, the senior senator from California, Alex Padilla. Thank you, Ben Ray. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, look, I'm going to try not to be too repetitive. We've had a lot to say for the last couple of weeks now, so you know where we stand. Uh, and it begins by reminding ourselves why we're in this position to begin with. It is because Republicans are holding hostage needed aid to Ukraine a democratic ally fighting back against Putin's invasion. They're holding that aid hostage in exchange for Trump-era border policies. They say there's a negotiation. I invite you to follow their Twitter feeds. I'll quote them. This is not a negotiation. This is a price to be paid for consideration of the president's supplemental request. That is not negotiations in good faith. I appreciate what Ben Ray said, and Senator Menendez and others. We're not the don't do anything caucus. Do we want to address, uh, do we want to update and modernize our immigration system? Absolutely. We know it needs to happen, and we know what needs to happen if you're genuine about improving the system. This is not it. What we hear is on the table in these quote-unquote negotiations. A return to Trump-era policies is not the fix. In fact, it will make the problem worse. Mass detention. Gutting our asylum system. Title 42 on steroids. It is unconscionable. That is not the way to fix our immigration system, we know that it will not work. We have our ideas, we have our plans, proven policies that will work. We need to help our Ukrainian allies, absolutely. And we need to address our immigration system. But we should not be holding one hostage for the other. We know the folks in the room are hearing us loud and clear. We need the White House to, to hear us loud and clear. 
And let me just remind you one last thing. This uh, aid for Ukraine that's being held hostage, it's something that Republicans, the majority of them anyway, not all of them, but the majority of Republicans already support. So they're holding something they support hostage for something they know is cruel. It's unacceptable. And we won't stand for it. Thank you. Now, it's uh, my honor to introduce uh, the uh, ranking member now <laughs> of the House Judiciary Committee. I'm a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, but the leader on the House side, Congressman Jerry Nadler. Thank you, Senator. Our Republican colleagues need to, hold, need to stop holding aid to Israel and Ukraine hostage over unrelated and draconian border policy demands. The fact that the Speaker of the House continues to insist that the House can only accept Ukraine aid if it is paired with the House Republican Fantasy Border Bill H.R. 2 is ridiculous. The bill barely passed the House due to bipartisan opposition. The Speaker's insistence on its inclusion appears just to be an excuse to avoid, to avoid an actual vote on aid to Ukraine. As it is, the border changes being discussed in the Senate are deeply troubling. They would decimate our asylum system, return us to Trump-era policies of transit bans, and further eliminate essential legal pathways. What's worse, none of these changes would actually fix the situation at the border. These are not solutions that would propel us forward into a better system. Instead, they would take us backwards. Sadly, we have seen the deadly and dangerous consequences of shutting our doors to refugees. With the United States joined with Canada and Cuba, in turning away the MS St. Louis and her more than 900 Jewish passengers in 1939, we allowed refugees to be returned to persecution in Europe. Nearly one-third of the boat's passengers perished at the hands of the Nazis. Many other countries also turned away Jewish refugees during World War II. The horrors that followed led to the creation of the United Nations and ultimately to the international refugee framework that we still use today, the asylum system. The changes being proposed in the Senate fly in the face of those commitments we made to ensure we never again return those seeking refuge to their persecutors. As we have said all year, it is long past time to reform our immigration system, which has been atrophying for three decades, by providing more legal pathways for people to come to the U.S., by modernizing the system for people to be able to work and to be with their families, and by hiring additional immigration judges and asylum officers so asylum claims can be heard quickly and efficiently without compromising due process. House Democrats have consistently offered and passed bipartisan solutions, like the Dream and Promise Act and the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. If the Senate really wants to make progress in immigration, it would act on these bipartisan bills instead of giving in to, giving in to Republican hostage-taking on crucial policy issues as part of a supplemental funding bill. The fact that the price for supporting our allies abroad and investing in our communities, communities at home <coughs> appears to be a return to the dark days of Donald Trump's immigration policies is a shameful sign of just how broken this Congress has become. Thank you, and uh, now we introduce the uh, chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and the KPAC Immigration Task Force co-chair, Pramila Jayapal. Thank you so much, Ranking Member Nadler. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Bargan, for your leadership on this and to all the CHC members as well. I uh, also want to thank my colleagues in the Congressional Progressive Caucus, um, which I am proud to, to chair. Uh, and we have been on the front lines of this debate. Let's be very clear once again about why we are here today. Republicans are choosing to hold Ukraine funding hostage in exchange for cruel and unworkable immigration policy demands. Senate Democrats and the White House must not agree to these extreme demands. It is imperative that my Senate colleagues and the White House understand what is on the table are policies so extreme that if enacted, 
it would literally be the most exclusionary, restrictive immigration legislation since the racial quota laws of the 1920s, literally turning the clock back 100 years. And I say that also as my position uh, as the ranking member of the Immigration Subcommittee. We also, by the way, were not consulted just as Senator Padilla's Immigration Subcommittee was not consulted. We absolutely need to reform the immigration system, which has not been reformed in 30 years and no longer meets our country's needs. But returning to Trump-era draconian policies that rely on enforcement-only strategies will not solve the problem. The proposals that are being discussed right now in the Senate would only create more chaos at the border and decimate our outdated, overburdened immigration system. It would completely shut down the asylum system for people who are facing danger in their home countries at risk of being sent back without any due process. Changing the credible fear standard, implementing a transit ban, enacting a new indefinite Title 42 type national expulsion authority and hugely expanding expedited removal that leads to mass deportations. These are hallmarks of Donald Trump and extreme mega Republicans. They cannot, cannot become the hallmarks of the Biden administration and Democrats. This is not how immigration policy gets done. Trading permanent policy changes for short-term, one-time funding is a bad deal. It won't fix the situation at the border. People come to the border because we no longer have a functioning immigration system that allows people many different legal pathways to match our country's real needs. Nor have we addressed the root causes of the countries that send people here. Those are the things that would actually make a difference. If we take this deal, let me just say this as well. What happens the next time the administration asks for more Ukraine funding or for some other must-pass bill? What Republican priority will they demand to extract a one-time ask? A nationwide abortion ban, perhaps? Gut Medicare and Social Security? Destroy public education? Strip voting rights? We would say no to those things. We should say no to this as well. As I have said more times than I can count, there are real fixes that are needed for the immigration system, but that is not what we're discussing here. We are ready to work with any of our colleagues who are serious about fixing the system and creating the legal pathways that we need to ensure an orderly process at the border, but in a thoughtful way, not as a ransom demand for Ukraine aid. I'm here today as an immigrant, the founder of the largest immigrant rights organization in Washington state, Progressive Caucus Chair, Cape Back Immigration Task Force Co-Chair, and the first naturalized citizen to serve as ranking member of the Immigration Subcommittee. I have worked on this issue for 30 years, so trust me when I tell you this. We have been trying a deterrence-only strategy for three decades, and it does not work. What does work, because we've seen it, is expanding legal pathways, ensuring people can come to the U.S. to be with their families and to work, providing aid to countries to actually address why people are forced to flee from their homes. It was the expansion of lawful pathways for Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela that reduced the numbers of migrants from those countries trying to arrive between ports of entry by 99% just since January alone. When we give in to extreme mega-Republican Trump-era policies, we all lose. We lose on policy? Yes. We lose on politics? Yes. We lose ourselves and our moral center. Stop this madness. The message is clear. No resurrection of anti-immigrant Trump policies. No destruction of the asylum system. No trading immigrant lives for foreign aid. No destruction of our own humanity. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Representative Raul Grijalva, ranking member of the Natural Resources Committee and the former co-chair of the Progressive Caucus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I, my colleagues have said it. They, they, they've laid out what we're here for, uh, to send a message to the Biden administration and to the Senate. The time, the hostage taking of the Republicans and the extremists in the House of Representatives has to end. And unfortunately, I've been here long enough to 
see this pattern over and over again. When we get to this point, the collateral damage that's put on the table, the expendable uh, commodity that is put on the table in negotiations is immigration, migrants, asylum, and refugee seekers. And we're here again. And, and giving in to racism in this issue, because it is, giving in to this hostage taken in blackmail, which it is, and giving in to the threat that the Republicans have made, that they're willing to undo Ukrainian aid unless they get what they want. And what they want is to fundamentally not only change, not only change, but construct an immigration system that we cannot call an immigration system. I feel that the Biden administration has to understand that we're here because we're not collateral damage. We're not expendable. <coughs> and that there are solutions to be taken, long range and short term. But I happen to have, I have the privilege of representing the entire border in Arizona with Mexico. The entire border, every port of entry, every community affected by this. And the humanitarian crisis, and it is a humanitarian crisis on the border, needs to be managed, it needs to be resourced, and it needs to be, and you need to work with local communities to assure that. And the long-term solution to a broken immigration system, as every member that has been up here has said, we are prepared to sit and talk in serious discussion about where to go forward. But that's not what's on the table. What's on the table is to further create chaos on the border, to make immigration the Achilles heel in the, in the, for Democrats in the coming election, and to twist an issue of human life and value into an issue that becomes a politically expendable commodity. I don't believe it is. I, I value that the majority of the people, in, not only in Congress in this country, believe that as well. And going forward, I think Biden needs to know. We've seen this movie before. That's right. We don't like the ending, and we're not going to tolerate the ending. That's Thank right. you very much. Hi, I'm Congressman Adriano Espaillat from New York. We're here to save asylum. <laughs> asylum is an intricate part of the fabric of America. It is deeply rooted in the every life, everyday lives of millions upon millions of American families that have come from all parts of the world seeking a better future. And we are at this crossroad, and this must, must not be a zero-sum game where an automatic win for one translate into a devastating loss for another. We don't have to push one down to lift another up. All ships could rise at the same time. And much has been said that we haven't proposed an alternative, and that's false. That's a lie. This caucus, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, have, has 17 principles that we've agreed on as solutions to the immigration issue confronting America. And this is not just about the horrible things that may be included in the supplemental, the Trump-like legislation that may be included there, but this is also about those other proposals that are not in the supplemental. Dreamers are not in the supplemental. Help to cities that harbor migrants is not in the supplemental. Family reunification yeah. is not in the supplemental. Expanded TPS yes. is not in the supplemental. So it is not just about the horrible issues and proposals that are being peddled as a three-car Monty game, a confidence game, but this is really about the solutions that have been kept out, deliberately 
premeditatedly kept out. So we're here to save asylum. Estamos aquí para salvar el asilo. Fundamentalmente parte íntegra de la experiencia americana. Las familias que vienen de todas partes del mundo buscando asilo aquí para asegurar el bienestar de todos. Y no se trata solo de las propuestas devastadoras que se incluyen en este presupuesto, pero también de las propuestas salvadoras que no se incluyen, como son el tema de los soñadores, el tema del TPS, de la reunificación familiar, de ayudas para las ciudades que le dan albergue a los emigrantes. Estamos aquí, we will not go away. Somos muchos y queremos más. Gracias. And next we. Sí se puede. Y ahora presentamos del estado de Texas a Joaquín Castro. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joaquin Castro. I'm very proud to represent my hometown of San Antonio, Texas, here in the House of Representatives. The United States of America became the strongest, greatest nation on earth because of immigrants, because it's an immigrant nation. And yet here we are with a Democratic president, a Democratic Senate, facing what are the most restrictive anti-immigrant proposals in many generations. I want to speak quickly to the Democrats in the Senate and others who are considering supporting this proposal. If you do so, you will be surrendering to right-wing racism, That's right. and more than that, you will be enabling it. A majority of the House of Representatives, and I believe of the United States Senate, supports funding for Ukraine in its war against the Russians who invaded them we should be able to pass that funding without sacrificing the lives of desperate asylum seekers. If these restrictions are passed, these draconian anti-immigrant policies are passed in a supplemental, more people who seek refuge in the United States and don't make it here will suffer. They will be oppressed. They will die because of it. Let us not pretend otherwise. There is no deal yet, as far as we know, and I hope that wiser heads will prevail. I hope the Democrats will understand that the right-wing appetite for fear-mongering, to use immigrants as political scarecrows, cannot be satisfied by this bill. They will still say that Democrats are for open borders. They will continue to lie. And yet, you will have sacrificed the safety and the future of millions. I urge my colleagues in the House and the Senate to reject any kind of proposal with these restrictive policies. And now I'd like to introduce a great colleague from our great state of Texas. That's Veronica Escobar of El Paso. Buenas tardes. Estoy aquí enfrente de ustedes con mucho orgullo de representar la comunidad del Paso, una comunidad fronteriza. I stand here in front of you with so much pride representing a great community on the U.S.-Mexico border, the community of El Paso. My community has been providing goodwill to migrants for decades and decades and decades. We have demonstrated to the country what can happen when people of goodwill choose to extend a helping hand to some of the most vulnerable among us. But I will also tell you at the same time, representing the community that last year saw the highest number of encounters with vulnerable migrants that the status quo is unacceptable. We have seen migrants arriving after being uh, extorted, sexually assaulted, threatened, 
attacked, detained on what is a journey filled with horrors. I have spoken with probably thousands of migrants just during my time in Congress, not counting my time preceding Congress. And my community has known for a long time that Congress needs to act, that the status quo isn't just unacceptable, it isn't just unsustainable, but the status quo is inhumane. But the answer is not more inhumanity in the face of an inhumane status quo. I can also tell you that my community and many of my colleagues who joined me on trips to El Paso, uh, we have brought almost 25% of Congress to my community on congressional visits. My, we have seen what happens with the implementation of the policies that are being discussed. I don't know what is actually being discussed. I'm not in the room, but we know from reporting that it is a return to Trump era policies. And while there might be an immediate short term impact on migrant arrivals, it does none of these none of these policies address the underlying issues. None of these policies address the broken system, and none of these policies acknowledge what all of us know, which is our country needs immigrants. That's right. Our country thrives because of immigrants. I bet every one of my colleagues can tell you stories about CEOs and business owners and leaders of industry who come to us saying, we need workers, we need a workforce. We've got to be competitive in the future. Immigrants make us better. They make us stronger. They make us more competitive as a country. And these are people who are literally dying to get here. They are literally dying to join with us to build a better country. We do have to fix the issues that we face. We face great challenges. I can tell you my community is tired. My local governments are tired of filling in for the federal government. My volunteers who volunteer at shelter networks throughout the community, they are exhausted. But what the Senate is talking about would be horrific. There is a better way. Compromise is possible. Compromise on bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform is possible. It is long overdue and all of us need to be putting that bipartisan effort, an emphasis on it to get this done because the political environment is getting worse, not better. And so we have to act but not on what the Senate is doing. I want to thank my colleagues for their strength, for their vigilance, and I want to introduce my comadre, Sylvia Garcia from Houston, Texas. You know, I almost didn't come today, and I didn't come because I was just so mad, so disillusioned, so disheartened, and just fed up with what I'm hearing that's coming out of the Senate that I was afraid that I was going to get up here and go Latina on everybody. And I really didn't want to do that. So instead, I'm just going to keep it short and simple because the senators have already told us what they know. We've already talked from the committee chairs here. We've talked from members. We know what the, what the challenge is. Nothing that's coming out of that supplemental will make things better. That's the real litmus test that we should be looking for to. Does it make it better? Because if the answer is no, then we, should, we shouldn't support it. Because asylum is a human right. We should work toward making sure that we keep families together. And there is no such thing as an illegal alien unless you met a Martian yesterday. That's right. So the bottom line is, we know what the issues are. And we do have solutions. It's already been mentioned. I have the Dream and Promise Act. 
Representative Escobar has a bill. Representative Giannis has a bill. We all have bills. They just don't want to listen and sit down and work with us on them. Son mentirosos. They will continue to tell you that we want the open borders. Mentirosos. They want to tell you that we have no solutions. Mentirosos. They want to tell you what they want you to hear and what their primary base wants to hear. So I don't know about you. I don't want the clock turned back to the Trump days of detention centers and children in cages and people being separated. Because if I wanted that, I would just vote it for Trump. But I voted for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. So we must do better. And I know that working together in a bipartisan fashion, we can. And we can make sure that the system works, that those cities get relief, that cities like mine in Houston, that after they cross the border, they come to us for jobs and housing and some transportation to get to their relatives in other parts of the country. We must do better as a federal government in helping the local communities. So all I can tell you this, I'm not turning back the clock and I'm not switching from my House Democrats blue shirt to a red MAGA hat. I'm sticking with Biden-Harris and I'm gonna trust them. But if they send that supplemental, that's one time I'm gonna say, sorry, I can't vote for you on this because I say no, hell no on the supplemental. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Congressman Chuy Garcia, a proud immigrant from the city of Chicago. And this afternoon, I'm very proud to stand with the CHC and our allies in sending a clear message to the White House. We are not ready and don't believe that the Statue of Liberty needs to be dismantled. The Statue of Liberty has been a symbol that has given people hope and opportunity for a better life. It has meant that it is a welcoming place where people can flee violence and intolerable conditions. And just as in Chicagoland, we welcome and in cities across the country, refugees from Ukraine in, and Afghanistan and integrated them quietly into our country, we say, why can't we do it now? We're not ready to dismantle the Statue of Liberty. And we tell President Biden, do not give in to the hostage-taking situation that extreme Republicans and their puppet master are forcing and trying to convince you to engage in. It is bad for our country. Asylum and parole authority by the executive is what sets our country from every other country on earth. To give in to that would be a step backward. It would take us further back into darkness. This is a moment to rethink where we are as a nation. It is a moment to consult the most affected communities, immigrants and Latino communities and other communities across the country. We have been excluded. That's not what the president campaigned on, and that's why today we underscore, don't leave us out. We are a part of the future of our country, and we think that this should continue to be the place where people can come to when they suffer from oppression and other bad things across the world. Reject the hostage taking. Let's have real negotiations and do it right. We've put forward proposals for good progressive immigration reform rooted in the great tradition that has been the American way and we should be upheld at this point in time in our history. Muy buenas tardes hermanos y hermanas. Esta tarde me da mucho orgullo estar con los miembros del caucus hispano. Le estamos reiterando a la Casa Blanca y al presidente Biden y a nuestros colegas en el Senado que no vayan a sucumbir y convertirnos en el chivo expiatorio, en el cordero que se va a sacrificar 
para satisfacer la agenda extremista del Partido Republicano. No queremos que de se desmantele la Estatua de Libertad. La estatua ha sido el símbolo que ha dado la bienvenida a los pueblos que sufren de la opresión, los pueblos que fugan y que buscan una vida mejor. La libertad y la oportunidad siempre ha estado en este país y ha sido la esperanza de todo el mundo. Ahora no es el momento de sucumbir a esas malas intenciones de quienes quieren crear una crisis. No es justo que seamos rehenes de una situación política manipulada por extremistas republicanos que solamente quieren crear más caos e injusticia en el mundo y en la frontera sur de nuestro país. Muchas gracias. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I understood what um, my, my brother from Illinois uh, said, but it sounded very impassionate. Um, and I, I will join him in saying that I am also a proud immigrant, a refugee that represents the great state of Minnesota. Um, I am here because I believe asylum seekers should be treated with humanity because I was. Because I believe that refugees should be welcomed in our country like I was. I am here because I reject in the strongest possible terms the inhumane Trump-era immigration policies that dehumanize migrants, turn away asylum seekers, and violate international law. To be clear, expelling migrants without asylum hearings is in direct violation of international law and the United States law, both of which guarantee the right to seek asylum. But just as importantly, they do, any, <clears throat> they do anything to make our country safer. Around the world, there are more people displaced now more than at any point in human history. Human rights violations, rampant violence, massive global inequality have produced migrants and refugee crises in the Northern Triangle to the Horn of Africa, from Venezuela to Ukraine to Sudan and Burma. It is no surprise that many of these people find themselves at our border with Mexico clinging to the belief that the United States is still a refuge for people fleeing violence and oppression. Like many of us, I have spoken to countless people in my district who have made unthinkable, dangerous journeys across land and sea to escape their homes. People who have been smuggled from Cameroon to Colombia, then crossed Central America by foot. Children who have fled gang violence in Guatemala, political dissidents who have been tortured in Egypt, families turned apart by civil war in Sudan. We solve none of these problems fueling this global crisis by punishing its victims. We will We will solve them by living up to our promise, by welcoming people who face credible threats of violence in our homeland. I know this because I was one of these people. I came to this country as a 12-year-old refugee after I lost everything in a civil war. And I would not be here standing in front of you as a member of Congress without the humanity and generosity of refugee resettlement groups our incredible country and the community of the Twin Cities that welcomed me with open arms. I hope we will remain a beacon of light and hope and that we will reject this cruelty and that we will live up to the promise of the Statue of Liberty in which the following words are inscribed. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the ratchet refuse of your teeming shore. Thank you. And with that, I introduce Representative Rob Menendez from New Jersey. Thank you. And um, 
And that type of personal testimony is why we need voices like this in the room when we're negotiating any immigration policy. Uh, because these voices, as you've heard from CHC members, CPC members, they're American voices. They reflect immigrant communities. They reflect the people who will be most impacted by what we decide to do with the future of our immigration policies here in the United States. I also have the honor of sitting on Homeland Security, where Republicans push through H.R. 2, their inhumane approach to the border. We know and have seen how bad this can get. I know they have an insatiable appetite when it comes to the border. If you give them more resources, they will talk about policy. If you talk about policy, they will want more resources. If you give them both, they'll want a wall. If you give them a wall, they'll want it to be twice as high. There is no end here for Republicans. They view this as an issue that they can win on the political front at the expense of Americans, at the expense of people who are sacrificing so much to have their shot at their American dream. My grandmother came to this country with two small children. I myself have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And I imagine every day when I read the stories about the people who are arriving at their borders, what type of tenacity that must take yeah. to go through that journey, to give your family a shot in this country. Yeah. And what we do when they arrive here is a reflection of who we are as a country, what we stand for. And if we turn them away, if we build a wall, that says more about us than it says about them. They want to be part of our American team. Instead of having a conversation about how we change our policies to bring them in, to bring them part of our country, make our country stronger, we're trying to turn in the opposite direction. Trying to eradicate asylum, trying to eradicate parole. For what? For what? To support our allies? How does that make any sense? That's why so many people are out here in the cold, because we're so frustrated by what we've seen. We're so frustrated by the direction that we're on. We should be having a real conversation. We want to have that conversation. Republicans don't because they believe this is the last issue that they can win on. This issue on your backs, on our backs, is the last issue that they can win on. We can't let them. We won't let them. And together, we are going to win the narrative and we will win the future of this country that looks like us, that's diverse like us, and will be better for every single American. Thank you all so much. And I have the honor of, rep of introducing my good friend and incredible representative for Florida, Maxwell Frost. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Congressman Maxwell Alejandro Frost, proudly representing Florida's 10th Congressional District here in the United States Congress. And I proudly stand before you as the son of a Cuban immigrant. My mom was just a little girl when she came to this country with her sister, her mom, my abuela, and my grandpa, all in search of freedom and opportunity. They went from Cuba to northern Cuba, which is Hialeah. <laughs> it's thanks to the bravery of my family that I'm able to stand before you here today. And it's because of the courage of refugees seeking asylum that I'm able to stand before you today. As a proud Afro-Latino, the first Afro-Cubano in Congress, and a proud, proud Floridian, I am deeply disturbed and disappointed by the reports that congressional Republicans are getting closer and closer and closer to their efforts once again to gut our immigration system at the expense of immigrants. And what's even more disappointing is the word that there are Democrats who aim to use immigrants, immigrant families, and refugees as a political bargaining chip. Let me be clear. I agree and we agree. We know that there is a humanitarian crisis at the border. We agree that our immigration system is completely broken and requires real comprehensive reform and change. But the problem here comes down to what your approach is. Is it about compassion? Is it about the will to stick to the values of this country? Because no matter who you are, when you are fleeing that persecution in search of freedom, we need to be here for you. We believe that this country has a duty to help innocent migrants fleeing instability and violence. We believe that all people, regardless of their status, should be treated with dignity and respect by virtue of being a human alive right now. We believe that reforming our immigration system will take a whole a government approach with a real conversation. And what we can't do is allow ourselves to sell out immigrants and the promise of this country because Republicans have decided once again to hold us at gunpoint. 
to fix this humanitarian crisis, we need real conversation. We need real legislating. Not a few senators sitting in some back room making the decisions. We cannot go back to the failed Trump era policies like Title 42. We cannot gut our asylum process and program to make it even harder for deserving humans facing real hardship to escape that violence and instability to come to this country. We cannot abandon our beliefs that every person deserves to be treated by compassion and with compassion by enacting that mandatory detention of migrants. As Democrats, our entire party from the White House to the halls of Congress must stay strong and reject Republican immigration and border proposals which don't aim to solve the problem but make it worse at the expense of our people. We cannot do that. My idea is this, let's not be like Ron DeSantis. Let's not be like Donald Trump. And let's stick to the values of what it means to be a Democrat and what it means to be a good human and treat this issue with the compassion and seriousness that it deserves. And if we continue to do that and come out like we are today, we will win. Si se puede! Si se puede! Si se puede! Si se puede! And without further ado, I'll bring up my brother from New Mexico, Representative Gabe Vasquez. Buenas tardes, me llamo Gabriel Vázquez y yo vengo de una familia de inmigrantes de Juchipila, Zacatecas. ¿Cómo estamos? <tose> Le quiero dar las gracias a los organizadores que están aquí con nosotros. Without the organizers, without the people power, this would not be possible. So let's give one more. Sí se puede. Sí se puede. Sí se puede. Gracias. It is people power that will truly change immigration reform in this country. And today a lot has been said, but I'm going to deliver my remarks in Espanol. Porque para mí es importante que nuestros, nuestra gente en este país entienda que tiene gente representando, representándolos en el Congreso. También tenemos mucho en común. Los americanos y los inmigrantes estamos persiguiendo juntos el sueño americano. Yo soy un producto de la frontera de México. Crecí en ambos lados del muro. Mis padres trabajaron en las maquiladoras. Y yo crucé la frontera cuando regreso a mi, a mi distrito para visitar a mi abuelita en la chaveña de Ciudad Juárez. Pero represento a Las Cruces, Nuevo México, el segundo distrito, como un orgulloso americano. Viviendo en la frontera, yo he visto los retos que enfrentamos en la frontera. Hoy especialmente con una crisis humanitaria y el flujo también de cosas como drogas y fentanilo a nuestro país. Y es una de las razones por que yo decidí a postularme para el Congreso. Porque estamos en un punto importante en el que necesitamos voces hispanas y voces inmigrantes para resolver estos problemas. Necesitamos soluciones que trabajan para todos. Pero no lo podemos hacer sin, dis sin discusiones con la administración. Que aún no incluye a los miembros del caco hispano en conversaciones sobre la inmigración. Los republicanos están tratando de legislar sin el Congreso para pasar proyectos de ley que no reflejan quienes somos como una nación de inmigrantes. Es hora de que reconozcamos la diversidad y la riqueza que aporta nuestra cultura de inmigrantes en este país. Debemos trabajar juntos para implementar leyes que en realidad ayuden a toda nuestra gente, protejan nuestros valores y fundamentalmente cambien el trayectorio de este país con humanidad y con justicia. Hemos esperado ya casi 40 años para abordar este tema y debemos de incluir las voces hispanas para cambiar las leyes migratorias en este país. Muchas gracias y con eso... I would like to introduce my colleague from Texas, Mr. Greg Kassar. Thank you, sir. Buenas tardes. I'm Greg Kassar, and I represent the heart of Texas. To be really clear, congressional Republicans want Democrats to do their dirty work for them. Why would we do that? Congressional Republicans want President Biden to sign Donald Trump's anti-immigrant policies into law. Why would he ever agree to do that? Imagine if what was being proposed today was a Trump-style abortion ban in exchange for Ukraine money. We would say no. Imagine if what was being proposed today was a Trump-style repeal of Obamacare. We would say no. And if Biden and Senate Democrats are being told that they need to pass a Trump-style anti-immigrant policy, we need to say no. Am I right? We need to just say no. My district is just an hour and a half from the border. 
And it is really clear that there is so much, we could do so much better on border issues. But what is being proposed by the Republicans is to make our immigration system worse and more broken. I don't think it's actually been said here clearly that Republicans are proposing to make it less legal to migrate. They're trying to make it harder to legally migrate. In fact, what Republicans are proposing is a Mexican cartel pipe dream of making it so that more folks have to migrate illegally. So they are trying to make it harder for the border to be orderly. They're trying to create more chaos so that they can go on Fox News and win elections. But we aren't here to just be on Fox News. We aren't here just to win elections. We're here to make things better for the American people. We're here to make things better for our constituents. And that's why we are telling President Biden and the Senate Democrats to hold strong and to not take the bait. We can pass support for our allies in Ukraine without throwing immigrant families under the bus. Republicans want Democrats to throw immigrants under the bus. We got to say no. Republicans want Democrats to throw working people under the bus. We've got to say no. Le decimos hoy al presidente Biden y al senador Schumer que en vez de estar ayudándole a los republicanos en sus propuestas racistas, que en vez vengan a nuestro, a nuestro lado, al lado de la justicia, al lado de la humanidad, al lado de los trabajadores, al lado de un pueblo y un país que tiene una historia de apoyar a los inmigrantes. Ven a nuestro lado y los apoyamos. Y si no, vamos a oponer y vamos a luchar en contra de estas propuestas racistas. Gracias. And to close us out, um, my sister, la congresista Adelia Ramirez from Illinois. ¿Tienen frío? No. Are you cold? No. Man. Que no hay frío. No one's cold here. No one's shaking. No one hopes that it was 65 degrees. No one. But in all seriousness, we will stand here another 5, 6, 10, 15, 20 hours if that's what it's going to take for our president to understand that what is being proposed is deplorable. It is irresponsible and it's unacceptable. I want you to look at the faces of the people that are standing here and have been standing for the last hour. They are the face that make up America. I just got back two days ago from Guatemala and Honduras. And as I stood there, I thought, yeah, I was 85 degrees. I should have enjoyed it more. <laughs> but more importantly, I remember talking to a family in La Estación, in Guatemala, in La Capital, a family from Venezuela. And this little girl that grabbed my hand me agarró la mano y me dijo, Señora, ¿nos puede ayudar? Can you help us? You see, they had been traveling for two and a half weeks through jungles and countries, and they had been robbed. They had seen and experienced, and that little girl had seen and experienced more than any of my colleagues who dare to use children as scapegoats for their political points. So I'm not going to get into detail of what my colleagues have already said, but what I need to do is I need to add to what Congressman Greg Kassar said. You see this game that we're playing about, give us HR2 and we'll give you Ukraine. It is a tactic and a strategy that they want to take till next November in order for Donald Trump to become the president of this country again. And what I am asking my colleagues, Democrats, the president, don't take the bait. It'll start here trying to create draconian law so that children don't have refuge in this country. And then we're going to come back in January. And then we're going to be working on a continued resolution unless we're able to move on appropriations. And they're going to come for more and for more and for more. There is no stop. Because the same people that say that they are Christians and love God somehow forgot the second commandment when it says love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is dissonance and hypocrisy at all times. And what we are saying today is we are absolute hell no to any supplemental budget that makes it impossible for children to enter this country seeking refuge. We are a hell no today, tomorrow, on Christmas Day, on New Year's Day, El Dia de Reyes, and the days go on. <laughs> yes. 
please don't take the bait. I will end by saying that as the only member of Congress in a mixed status family, I will refuse to be used as a tool for Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and any of those who try to take the humanity from the people in this place. And so let's work on immigration reform. Let's work on legal pathways. But let's say hell no to deplorable policies that take us back. And with that, we are going to end. We don't have Q&A, but if you want to talk to any of the members left here standing or any of the people here, we'll be taking interviews. Thank you very much. Yeah, all right. Be ready for the